Well, my name is Robert Straub. I'm the CEO of Sieps Zurich Campus based in Horgen, Switzerland. Thanks for joining us today to our next uh, webinar in the series. This is the, uh, the fourth webinar in our Future of Work series. The series consists of five webinars on key topics relating to the future of work. It's a broad term, but we like to, we're focusing on topics such as specifically diversity, culture, talent management, leadership, new business models, and more. All of our topics have something to do with technology and more recently, COVID how COVID-19 is affecting the workplace and today business models. For this webinar series, we're partnering with Swiss Re, Ehrlichon, I4CP, Boyden, and Mercer, as well as SEEPS professors and other expert input speakers to bring you a diverse and current thought leadership content. In case you don't know about SEEPS, I'd like to share you a, show you a slide about SEEPS. SEEPS, uh, top left with who we are, we were the first business school in mainland China to receive both the Equus and the AAC American accreditations, which is very important for us that kind of accredits, accredits us and gives the, the authority to do what we're doing internationally. Yeah. We're very humbled that two weeks ago, our, G, our GIMBA program, our global executive MBA program was ranked number two in the world and number one for being this, the, a solo program. Our MBA program, our full-time MBA program has been ranked number five in the world recently by uh, the Financial Times, both in 2019 and in 2020. Our flagship programs as a, as a business school, our MBA programs, our EMBA programs, executive MBA, our finance MBA, hospitality MBA, uh, in collaboration with EHL, also here in Switzerland and Lausanne. And about half of our all of our business is doing uh, executive education programs for firms like yours. We have five campuses, uh, obviously in Zurich, where we're running this program out of today, Beijing, Accra, uh, Shenzhen, and the, the main headquarters campus is in Shanghai. We have about 70 full-time uh, staff, uh, faculty. Uh, most of them are based out of the Shanghai campus, coming from 20 different countries from around the world. We have about 350 people that are adjunct faculty. And we're very proud that we have a very, very deep uh, and strong alumni association of about 26,000 people in, in 80, 85 countries. Today's webinar is focusing on shifting business models in partnership with Boyden, one of the leading executive search firms. And we'll come to that in just a second. Shifting business models. We welcome you to uh, ask questions via the Q&A function throughout the webinar, not the chat function, the Q&A function, and we'll try to get through some of them at the end. And the way this works is typically we're going to have uh, the professor share uh, her, her inputs and then we'll have the, the uh, industry specialist on my share. Um, mm -hmm. But before we do that, uh, before I introduce you to both of them, I'd like to conduct a quick poll. To what extent has your organization gone through a business model transformation due to the current pandemic? Not at all to complete transformation. So here we see uh, clearly, and I didn't expect this, uh, when we look at the ranking of you know, 10 being complete transformation, it would be pretty radical to see a firm that's totally upended. On the other hand, we see some that are, have not really done anything at all. Um, and that's also not, 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 not that surprising for us, I guess. So we see a little bit of transformation. 16% um, have, have given a, a number of eight, which I consider that to be pretty high. So maybe when we come to the Q&A, you can tell us a little bit about that. I have a second question here in the poll. If we can maybe launch the second question. Yeah, so regarding the transformation, how well do you think the leadership of your organization has managed the business model shift? One being terrible, 10 being great. And this is part of the discussion. It's not just about the business model, it's about having the leadership and the culture in place to be able to do this. And that's where we have two experts on here coming at this topic from different angles. Great, so let's look at this. So uh, again, if we, if we look at this curve, you know, we have one person actually who gave it a nine, 
we have zero that gave it a 10 and it's the standard bell curve that is also leaning towards the lower side. The, the fatter tail is towards the ones and the twos, meaning um, the management didn't manage this that well. When we have um, you know, quite a few, we've got actually 10, 20, 30, 35% that gave it a three or lower. That's pretty low, that's pretty low. So Armin's gonna be here and the average is 28%. Um, that's okay, it's not great. Um, and this is about, this is why we're doing this discussion. Uh, leading change isn't easy. <laughs> it's not desired and it's not easy. So we're gonna be talking about how to do this better in a little bit. So thank you for that. Let's um, move on a little bit. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our two speakers, Professor Gubai, She's an assistant professor of strategy at SEEPS. Her current research primarily focuses on government, governance design, on the digital economy, adaptive efficiency, and collective creativity. Those are great terms, aren't they? Her recent research about organizational structure and, and governance in the internet era has attracted a lot of attention, both from academia and the business world. Armin Meyer, uh, she's based in, in our campus in Shanghai. Armin Meyer is based in, in Zurich. He's a managing director of Boyd in Switzerland, a headhunting search firm. He's a member of, uh, of my Zurich advisory board of SEEPS locally because of his experience and depth and, and connections. He's held many C-level executive positions in multiple industries and mainly at the CEO level. Gives him, he has a deep understanding about people, about leadership and that transfer across industries. I will uh, pass the word to you, Professor Ginko. The word is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, I'm very happy today to share with you some of my uh, point of views about the shifting business models in this remote working era. Um, well, the year 2020, surely everyone has a lot to say about this year because so many things has happened. Like the transformation has so been so dramatic. Some people even describe the times before COVID as BC and after COVID as AC. So, well, I, I guess everyone has their view about how much has been changed, but of course uh, our everyday life has to completely um, Elder. I just talked with Robert. It has been a long time. Our Swiss campus has welcomed any Chinese guests. They used to be so busy with all these uh, visits. And um, nowadays, we're kind of isolated. But fortunately, we have internet. And the joke is that, you know, who led the digital transformation of uh, your company? The correct answer would be COVID-19. It's true that uh, during the pandemic, we see tech uh, digital technologies and digital companies has been contributing quite a lot uh, in the crisis, in how we handle the crisis. And also a lot of the companies has been leveraging digital technologies to uh, move their business on as normal. Uh, today, uh, thanks to Zoom and other digital technologies, we can actually have this sharing happening. And that's actually some evidence of it. If you're looking at the stock market, the tech companies are certainly among the uh, best performers um, in the past several months. Uh, looking at this chart, you can see that towards the end of it, you see a very sharp rise of the curve. And that's exactly what happened to the share price of tech heavy uh, companies in, Mar in the NASDAQ in the past, uh, past months, especially after the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. And um, well, even if you are not a tech company or internet company, um, according to a survey by McKinsey and Company, you can see that most of the companies have actually experienced certain kind of changes um, towards uh, a further degree of digitalization. And um, uh, in our survey, of course, uh, we also see that many people has responded saying that their company has experienced quite a lot of change. Among them, most certainly uh, the, um, the most change would be about, or the most dramatically change would be about the way we meet each other. And that's exactly also what is happening now today. So I have some observations that might be a little bit uh, counterintuitive somehow. 
Uh, the first one would be I feel that uh, in the during or even and after the COVID crisis, business needs to actually be more uh, responsive, like which means both uh, they need to be responding uh, very rapidly to their customers' needs. And also they need to be addressing their customers' needs in a more uh, tailor-made way. So they really need to pay attention to the specifics of customers', uh, customers um, demand and requirements because uh, during the pandemic, of course, uh, people will decrease or during the lockdown, people can't really uh, leave their apartments, which means a lot of the distribution channels that we have got so used to uh, has been uh, interrupted, especially uh, in the uh, retailing business. So the line between, on, uh, between online and offline certainly bl blurs after uh, the COVID broke out. Uh, in China, for example, we have already been um, a global leader uh, in digital economy, especially as regard to e-commerce and electronic payments. Uh, if you're looking at this uh, chart uh, on the left side, we can see very clearly that um, China is leading the rest of the world. Uh, China's uh, uh, share of uh, total uh, retail that is carried out by the e-commerce has reached almost 25%. And I believe during the pandemic, this ratio has been again dramatically raised, uh, especially for the domains that people were not used to be doing the shopping online, for example, uh, for fresh uh, vegetables and, um, and fruits. So grocery shopping uh, during the pandemic also has been completely uh, shifted to online. And uh, we see a lot of uh, companies who are doing business in that, uh, in that area has been growing very rapidly uh, during the pandemic and afterwards because people's purchasing behavior has been somewhat permanently changed. And if I'm looking at um, the, uh, the uh, chart that is on the right side also, you can see that the change is not just uh, with uh, retail, uh, with uh, medical services, um, well, uh, certain ways of uh, demonstrating um, the, uh, for example, this uh, virtual uh, property showroom. Uh, uh, so in real estate uh, sector as well. So we can see both uh, have a lot of changes has been happening and uh, the ratio of the change, uh, the rate of the change has been uh, rather dramatic. And um, as, as we mentioned, as a lot of the traditional distribution channels has been disrupted, uh, the businesses now needs to face their customers in a more direct way. Uh, in China, for instance, uh, in the past months, we really see the rise of uh, what we call zhibo, which means um, there is some kind of live streaming uh, where people will sell uh, products online. And that part of the e-commerce, that form of e-commerce has been uh, really ripening very sharply and have attracted a lot of attention. So it doesn't really, it doesn't just change the, the, the lives of the KOLs or uh, other uh, appealing eaters, but, um, but also uh, it really changed uh, a lot of the, um, the companies, the way they handle business, the way they get in contact with uh, their customers. They're forced to then uh, apply uh, these kind of ways like the live streaming to uh, be able to reach their, their customers. Of course, in China, we just had the uh, so-called Double Eleven uh, Festival, uh, where people do uh, um, a lot of promotions online. So the e-commerce uh, sales normally uh, really got a very high uh, level during this time. But um, so, so this year, actually, uh, that continues to be very strong. Uh, but uh, compared with the previous years, the growth rate is not as sharp as, uh, as before. A another uh, very important change is that um, the customer's uh, information capability gets uh, dr dramatically enhanced as well. So what is information capability? In economics, we used to say that price is really the uh, nexus of that convey a lot of information about the product. Um, because that's the result of uh, all the competitions uh, in the market. But nowadays, actually, the customers do not only rely on prices to direct 
um, their uh, purchase or to, to make their purchasing decisions because uh, they can have direct, direct access to a lot of uh, information about the quality of the products. And uh, all these information will help them to make a more rounded uh, judgment uh, better than before. And that poses uh, a very big challenge uh, for the businesses because then um, they need to think about exactly what they offer. And also a lot of uh, new business models can emerge due to this. For example, in China, we have um, some um, um, companies, for example, Wang Yi and Xuan NetEase, they uh, will be selling uh, products without any brand, uh, but uh, those uh, products will be directly uh, sourced from uh, big suppliers to good brands. And uh, because people trust uh, the, the reviews, because people can read into uh, the dis distribution of the products, so they can make decisions uh, without solely relying on, let's say, information that is conveyed with traditional symbols such as price and brand. And um, another observation I think is very important is that the realm of collaboration is actually getting larger, not smaller. Well, we might think that we are isolated, but looking at tonight, for example, uh, I'm comp uh, communicating with you uh, from Shanghai, and uh, I don't even know who, where you guys are located. You might be everywhere in the world. So, so the, the realm of collaboration is getting larger and also the degree of complexity of uh, potential co uh, collaborations for businesses and among supply uh, of the supply chain might actually get more complicated, uh, not uh, simpler. So if I look at the, the, the trade data, for example, uh, China's trade um, with uh, the rest of the world has been actually bouncing back really quickly. And um, even we do not think about COVID related products, uh, we can see the light blue line that is the non COVID related products is also on a very steady rise. And again, I was just giving an example of um, the webinars we have been holding. So um, that's um, my second point. And the third point is that um, the pace of change uh, is also getting faster, not slower. Well, uh, here I'm giving an a, a example of a Chinese company called Uniview. So this is a company based in Hangzhou and um, they were doing businesses that is in uh, surveillance equipments, but uh, now it's expanding, of course, uh, much larger than that. And um, you can see that uh, on the left side, uh, this is a new product they have just launched. Uh, it has been uh, released uh, in August. So uh, only several months after the outbreak of uh, COVID. And what is this box? So this box uh, helps you uh, to disinfect your, uh, your masks and your cell phones. So, so these are little things that you carry with you everywhere. So even if you wear masks when you go out, um, so there might still be viruses that um, is attached to your phones or other things. And it's very difficult to uh, disinfect everything. So, so this little box will help you uh, to clean everything, uh, use um, ultraviolet light. And also on the right side, you can see that um, this is a, a door uh, that is not just like for security purposes, it also has a thermal detector that will detect your, uh, your temperature. And um, they managed actually uh, to uh, build 15 production lines in mere seven days. And these seven days are during the pandemic. And, and to be more exact, it's immediately uh, after the outbreak of, the pandemic, uh, of COVID in China, which means it was during the Chinese Spring Festival. So most of the people were not working and uh, a lot of the people actually went back to their, their hometowns and it's very difficult also during that time to travel back. So even under very difficult situations, they managed to build 15 production lines in seven days. That's, that's just remarkable. And the product they designed was actually new. So they, and um, well, we were talking about the renewal of business models. Uh, just then I have actually already mentioned some of the changes in the 2C sectors. And even for uh, B2B sectors, uh, a lot of change has already been occurring as well, uh, especially with the ways that um, the sales team, uh, because with 2B businesses, normally 
uh, they really emphasize uh, seeing their customers face to face. But during the pandemic, it has been very difficult. And but however, people uh, manage to find new ways of communicating with their customers. And um, nowadays, as far as I know, uh, this has like even in China now, things are kind of back to normal. Uh, we can travel freely, but um, but still a lot of these changes has remained. Um, well, here I, I gave a, a, a photo. Uh, in the center of the photo, you can see this person holding a sword. Uh, that's actually Jack Ma. So this photo was shot uh, in 2003 uh, when SARS broke out in China. So I put it here just to remind uh, everyone that actually Taobao, now a huge business and um, e-commerce platform in China, was actually created in 2003 when SARS broke out. So just another proof to show that um, new business models actually emerge uh, during this kind of crisis. Uh, something I want to especially emphasize is that um, during the SARS pandemic, uh, the, the whole team of Alibaba actually were working uh, remotely. So the creation, the birth of uh, Taobao actually were the, the results of re remote uh, working and remote uh, collaboration. So just to see that um, a lot of the things, of course, can be achieved uh, by collaborating um, in, in a virtual way. But of course, there's a dark side of everything. Um, the a survey by McKinsey as well uh, showed that uh, people also are quite stressed and exhausted um, during the pandemic with the mode of uh, remote working. Uh, especially families with kids, probably, uh, as the kids has been had stayed at home for such a long time and do all this uh, remote schooling. Uh, it has been uh, extra um, extra um, pressure for the parents, and um, many parents has been complaining about that, and um, was uh, really cheerful when the schools reopened. Um, another thing I would like to really emphasize is that the impact of uh, the COVID um, on the labor market could be uh, potentially very, um, very damaging in a sense because uh, more and more companies and factories begin to realize that uh, this kind of pandemic and a crisis um, can very easily disturb their workforce. For example, in China, as I mentioned, as uh, the pandemic happened uh, during the Spring Festival, a lot of people were trapped at their hometowns and cannot get back to work. So even if the, the companies want to, uh, to restart, um, they have very difficult time uh, handling uh, this situation. And also, of course, uh, during the pandemic, it would be uh, the priority for all these companies to protect the safety of their employees. And that's actually also an extra burden on the, uh, the, comp the business uh, owners. So uh, they might have extra incentive then to apply working modes that are more automated, uh, which means that you use machines to replace human labor. And if that trend becomes more salient, um, well, uh, the, um, the, the risk or, or the, the, the threat of digitalization uh, towards uh, the labor market and especially the problem of unemployment uh, might be again um, more um, more strengthened and um, and, and also uh, us now physically uh, we can't travel as freely as we used to be we got a lot of information online um, but however um, that can also potentially leads to another problem that is we begin to be trapped actually um, in certain kind of um, very close circles because we read uh, and we listen to, inf uh, to different, uh, the source of information might be limited. So it's ironic because when the internet were, uh, were invented, we think that uh, there will be a free flow of information and the, um, the world will be better connected and will, will be able to understand each other better but the red reality seems to be the opposite. And if you're looking at many places in the world, the social divide and the common understanding seems to be actually a bit hard. So we might be living now more and more in an interconnected but fragmented world. And that's really something we need to look at. So um, while well, I'm seriously over time here, so, um, so just to sum up, um, I feel that um, 
in the future, we, we, we are really in a time, like it's, it's true, I mean, this uh, after COVID thing, the AC thing is not just a joke. It's true that uh, with the change in technology, political uh, logics and economic logics, um, what the world will be experiencing uh, significant changes. Uh, and also it's very, as there's going to be a lot of uh, divide as we just described, so there will be a lot of vacuums for us to fill. So uh, I, I guess it's very important for us to remember that we, we really need to set up certain kind of common goals. And uh, in my personal point of view, it really should be about social well-being. And uh, in the future, well, we, we, we are going to need a more responsible leadership for sure. And uh, every one of us, we need to uh, really uh, stick to our in integrity and we need to be more creative. And by creative here, I don't even just mean, you know, to be smart and um, make changes here and there. I, I really hope somehow collectively we can be more uh, um, constructive in the sense that we, we really have the capability to shape uh, the future. So we really to lay down some fundamental institutions and organizations. And um, it's certainly always very easy to fight with each other, but um, it's more difficult, but more necessary to collaborate. So that's certainly uh, some points, I guess, we have to remember uh, when we build this uh, new uh, after COVID time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ginko. thanks a lot. We're going to come to we've got some questions coming in but i'm going to turn it uh, directly over to you armin and uh and have you talk a little bit about the, exactly this slide the leadership uh challenge that this is all about that we're confronted with and as we remember back from the poll um the leaders didn't weren't aren't doing a great job about leading the transformation armin the floor is yours Thank you. It's a bit of an experiment, if I may say, because I, I decided not to show any and share any slides, uh, but I pulled up a, a background instead, which is actually being taken off the campus of the Horgan, uh, Horgan campus of Seeps uh, on a really beautiful day. So you see the Lake of Zurich, etc. Now, anyways, um, the focus of my few minutes I have is the question actually, how then can we do all these transformations which Professor Gorgai has gone through with us? How can we actually remain to be successful as a company, as an organization? So there are big differences and we agree on that, that there are companies who actually ride that wave and others go down uh, and drown. And what makes them different? So first is, of course, the sector they are in. Yes, the sector is very important. So travel, entertainment, etc., are sectors which struggle and they struggle very hard and they have to probably reinvent themselves altogether. But then you have all the other sectors who are more or less affected, short or long term. And within all these sectors, you see clearly companies who win and others who have a hard time to even get out of the trenches now. So what differentiates the winners from the others? My answer is, and after you know, 40 years of executive leadership, my answer is it's all about leadership, in fact. And there are a few elements. And let me quickly touch upon a few of them. I will neither be scientific nor complete, but it is a personal pick of, of things which cross my mind when it comes about success in those troubled times. First of all, are you ready? So, and if not the most important aspect of managing a crisis like this one is to prepare and train. Do you have a plan for that crisis, for that, some people call it the black swan, maybe it's not, but do you have a plan for that crisis? Have you trained your plan maybe even repeatedly? If yes, you will be definitely faster out of the gates and you are already active dealing with the post-COVID crisis while others are still counting the damage. And one example a professor shared it with us is the Chinese economy. China was trained in dealing with pandemics and hence China is out of the, the gates already while we are all still struggling with second and third waves. A second element is your leadership team in an organization. Is it a team or is it just a gathering of solid individuals? 
like in sailing, I used to be a sailor myself. In sailing, you don't want to take a new crew in a storm without preparation. So you prepare before as well. As the leader, you pick your team, being ruthless on adherence of the established values. In good times, you don't suffer, suffer from bad choices and people who don't fit are not fit for purpose as much as you do in challenging times. And crises bring out the best and the worst in people. We heard that before. And in teams too, I'd like to add. Now, once you are in that crisis, once you are prepared, what are the do's and don'ts? First, you should not throw all your values overboard while you are in a crisis. It was so hard to build them, to build your culture, to establish your values and many companies we see right now, they just destroy that franchise, you know, in, in days with employees, with clients, etc. Instead, focus on involving people in becoming a part of the solution. Push transparency further. Let people know your affiliates, your associates, your employees. Let them know how things are and what they are expected to do. Take care of your workforce, even in a time of crisis, or especially so, they are your value, most valuable asset. Don't stop training people and especially leaders. The leaders are now confronted with those new times, the new leadership we heard before. So we need to give those people a chance and an opportunity to cope with those new times. So deep democracy, it's easily said, but it's hard to implement. Holacracy, networks, the always on philosophy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So give leadership a chance to learn and to cope with these changes. Teach them and spend some money on developing people. And of course, communicate, communicate, communicate. Use all channels which are available. And then the next point boils down on you, on leaders as individuals. It's easy to say you should be more creative, you should form the future, you should shape the, the, the presence, but also the present times, but also the future times. That's easily said, but you have to make sure that you as a leader try or keep the balance between the it, the organization, the we, the friends and family, and yourself finally as well. These times demand everything from us leaders since now approximately already nine months. How long will you as a leader be able to survive if you don't balance your needs with those of your job? Allow enough time to relax, turn off the noise and the messaging torrent. Get enough sleep. It's very simple indeed and it's easily said. Enjoy your family and friends. And allow some time, for you, some time also for yourself. The crisis will not be over when the vaccine is available. And that even may take a long time. But we believe that there is a new time coming and the old times are gone. So after the crisis is maybe before the crisis. And you should be fit for a long time to come. Try to keep the can-do instead the won't work attitude. Assume that there are opportunities out there even in these times. There are huge opportunities out there for those who see them. Those who are willing to see them, they will. And those who are willing to jump on them will get the benefit. From products to platforms, from projects to solutions, increase the stickiness of your clients, etc. The next point is get rid of behaviors and styles from the past. I think we are now getting into those new times, new normal, but we still deal with budgets, with three-year plannings, with top-down information sessions, and all these kinds of things, which my belief are things of the past. How can we budget you know, for the next, let's say 12 to 18 months, if we don't even know what's going to happen next Monday. So instead of beyond of budgeting, you can go beyond budgeting with a rolling set and reset of ambitions. Replace that you know, budgeting cycle with 
a continuous planning and ambition setting cycle, et cetera, et cetera. And use technology. And if you feel you are not uh, up to date in terms of technology, please get out of the way. Nobody can afford to do things the usual way or the way we have done it in the past. We have to change and we have to change very fast. In most of the cases, those changes are actually linked with technology. You don't think how many business cards I still get these days with fax numbers printed on it. Fax numbers? When was it that you sent the fax for the, for the last time? Really? So here you see that's only just one element which shows how difficult it is to change. And that leads me to probably the last point, learn and unlearn constantly. Learn by asking questions to people who are more advanced in specific elements than you are. Asking questions is the first step to learning, accepting that you don't know everything or, you are, or are you still an expert who does not need to ask questions. But also do get rid of experience which bogs you down, does not let you change. So unlearn as well as you do learn. And the last point, really the last point now is what Professor Guobai already mentioned before, listen to your clients. They will tell you what they would like to have changed, adapted. Uh, of your products and services set. These were a few examples, you know, from my side and few thoughts. Thank you. Back to you, Robert. Thank you. A lot of good reflection. We and a bunch of questions were coming in as as both of you were speaking. Um, so very often, what we do during these sessions is we ask someone to be a experienced observer, other than myself. <laughs> And we have with us today, Professor Viviana Fang He. She is an associate professor at Essex Business School in, in uh, France. She's a senior research fellow at the ETH, at the MTech at the MTH. Uh, she's been doing um, research on collaborative innovation and new venture creation. She teaches entrepreneurship and strategy. Viviana, could you give us a two minute response really just two minute response to Ginkgo's and Armin's reflections. Thank you, Rob. I'm really happy to be here. Um, just Welcome. adding to Professor Bai and Armin's excellent points, I would like to share two points of observation and reflection. So the first one being that how the pandemic has forced entrepreneurs to really rethink about the personal experience when delivering their products and services. Take dining, for example. During the first wave of COVID, restaurants had to be closed in many European countries. So now think about the question, how could the gastronomy industry continue to deliver uh, not only good food, but also the social experiences we value so much, such as dining out with friends, you know, celebrating a special occasion with our family, or simply visiting our favorite restaurant and having a chat with the chef. Here in Zurich, there are three wonderful ladies. I would call them local business leaders. They are Anna, Daniela, and Steffi. They got together and founded this uh, social kitchen. That's a website connecting patrons, restaurant owners, and mm -hmm. chefs. So through social kitchen, people can, um, can pay for a particular menu, and then they could cook together with the chef and learn and explore a recipe and have a social dining experience together, all by Zoom, of course. But that is a really fun and um, really um, comforting experience during that period of isolation. So I would really like to say that that's an example of um, innovative business model. And that's such an innovative way to save the small businesses and develop a sense of solidarity when the, uh, when the virus struck our community the hardest. So that's point one. The second point being that sustainability now is not merely a stakeholder mandate anymore. It represents a business opportunity. So I teach entrepreneurship. In my MBA class this year, 
all the business models came up by student teams had an element of sustainability in it. For example, one team is trying to develop an app that helps people recycle different materials. And another team is setting up a platform for this uh, green household type of house improvement projects. Let's think about the trend going forward. With the US coming back to Paris the agreement, hopefully <laughs> this mm -hmm. is going to happen, and the Chinese government committing to achieving the carbon neutral by 2060, there will be a surge of opportunities for business models aiming to address sustainability issues. In addition, the pandemic has also led us, every one of us, to rethink our relationship with nature. Mm. Many friends of mine and colleagues of mine, including myself actually, have developed a habit of much less business travel, much more sustainable way of commuting and eating less meat. Yeah. So even when we go back to the new normal, these habits or consumer trends are here to stay. And mm. I think they represent um, new demand for updating our business models. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Fabiana, for sharing. I'm, I'm going to comment something you just said. I'm not sure going back is an option for some things. And if I to use your your um, your example of gastronomy, probably two or three days a week, I'm based in Horgan. I would get on a train. I'd walk to the train station. I go to Zurich. I meet with Armin for lunch. You know, it takes me 45 minutes to get to the lunch. It takes me an hour and a half to have lunch. 45 minutes coming back. Today. 95 it's not happening but i'm not going back to that most of us aren't going back to most of those things armin and i can have this call the 30 minutes we can do it at coffee we can have it be very personal very real maybe it's more difficult to start a relationship but to continue a relationship absolutely so that model is for most of many of us just gone the business lunch I'm just not going to do it because I've seen that my time is so much more preciously spent. And I can still do that because I found a way that I can have the meeting with Armin, as an example, right here and I'd have it be just as meaningful, just as intense as the face-to-face -face most of the time, you know? So um, another thing I'd like to comment on is in, in setting up today's discussion, we were talking before we go to the Q&A, um, we, a lot of this we're talking about new business ideas. New business ideas, greenfielding, um, seizing the right timing and the opportunity in, this, in these changing times versus, so that's, that's difficult because you've got to have the idea, right? The idea, the spark for entrepreneurs is the hardest part of it. You can have the marketing, you can have IT people, you can have finance people, but the idea is the hardest thing the great idea. But the even harder th is than this is the greenfielding is changing the business model of existing firms. When I look, so when I was beginning, when we were talking about this topic originally, I'm thinking about companies like Airbus, about Volkswagen, the largest car manufacturer in the world, for ThyssenKrupp, the steel industry, for Robert Bosch, and those are happen to be four big, big industrial firms that are the size of aircraft carriers. And so it takes them 10 nautical miles to change direction. And they say the bigger, the slower you're going to be and the less you're going to change. And yet all four of those firms are huge Goliath sized companies, but they're managing through the change. So does anyone want to comment on Greenfield versus, say, an industrial company who's really gone through a change, and also the, the leadership to do that, right? It's one thing to have a great idea and start something new, but Armin, you know, if you know, if my leadership team is focused on this way, it's very hard to get all of them shifted to a new way of thinking and doing inside of, say, 9, 10, even 24 months. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, first of all, Robert, I will miss those lunches with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, though. <laughs> I will probably starve. Yeah. I mean, the, the misconception we have today is we, we use the term social distancing. I think that's wrong. I think it's we talk of physical distancing and not social, in fact. 
and in contrary socially we should grow together in fact more more frequently and more densely than before but physically we should be distanced mm -hmm. and what my experience is with those meetings which happen to be virtual they are often more personal in fact as well funny enough because now we sit at your home I look at your postcards in the background mm -hmm. and then we have a kind of a conversation which is very different to the one which you would have a meeting in my office. Mm -hmm. Now the question of the, the bigger against the smaller companies or the, the more nimble against the slow moving animals. Since many, many years, I think I have a, a, a kind of a concept in my mind which drives me a bit is that the concept of the dancing elephant. And my view is an elephant doesn't necessarily need to just stand still because he or she is so big and, and heavy. But we think that we, we find forms of companies who are actually like elephants, but they dance. And they dance because management is alert, is, is um, um, also always a bit concerned about the current status. They are always alert, they are always open, they have their sensors out in the marketplace, they listen, they ask questions, they are never satisfied and never complacent. And this is probably the, the ingredient of a dancing elephant, mm -hmm. if I may use this picture again. I like that, thanks. But it takes a special leader to be dancing all the time. Not all of them are, unfortunately, right? And I, I come back to this question, that comes for all three of you. You know, we talk about fit to lead, fit to lead. Um, why do we get it so wrong so often? I had a, a, a meeting that I was actually asked to be a on the board to, uh, to talk to the board of a local hospital here in Switzerland. Their head of the hospital, they're firing, they're fired because the individual just couldn't manage the change that's being confronted. Um, and in this situation, in, the, in this health pandemic that we're literally having, that person needs to be extremely adaptive. And so they went through every, they went through many mediations and inofficial discussions and official discussions and the person was very rigid and now they have to make the radical change of, of getting rid of this person because, uh, and, and for everyone else, everyone shakes their head and says, sorry, it was so easy to get right. Why did you get it so wrong? And this happens a lot, you know, when we, and it's, not, yeah. So how can we, it sounds so easy fit to lead, but doing it in these times is so incredibly hard. Any thoughts from any of you about that? Robert. Yeah, that's an intriguing question. Um, I'm also reflecting on your earlier question in terms of size, whether being big uh, will um, is always uh, associated with um, you know resistance or slow to react. And I think eventually this comes really comes down to the mindset of the leaders, because um, in the big companies you also have a lot of resources and know-how and deep pocket that could enable you to react fast. Yeah, so back to Armin's point that this dancing elephant. So I think a lot has to do what's in the mind or what's in the leadership of that elephant, whether you can actually um, master the resources and, and drive your people to follow a vision to actually react to crisis in a very um, uh, agile way. And but with these big and successful companies, perhaps the prior success is the curse or the, the obstacle here because you are very comfortable with, with uh, what you have been doing successfully. When the right. crisis hits, you are thrown into the unknown territory. You have um, very little um, experience to draw from. It's, it's uh, frightening for people to venture into unknown territory. So what they, the, the instinct is to hold on to what you know. So mm -hmm. that success um, will become the obstacle for, for many large and successful companies to move um, in a very, very agile way into uh, exploration to, to experiment um, new business models. And another caveat is when, when many companies 
try to explore new business models. They're trying to replace an existing function. But as you said, there is no normal to go back to. Mm. So it's not enough to just to think about how do I replace a certain function? How do I do the same thing mm. with the new technologies? <clears throat> Instead, I think as business leaders, they should be thinking about how to do certain things better rather than just then replacing one function. If, if we look at the <laughs> literature has shown this, you're, the, the, you're all doing research on this and the, the firms that actually are, are lasting the longest, <laughs> you know, um, if we look at these, you know, the top firms that are like Proc Procter & Gamble, uh, US company, their adaptability over, over 200 years, basically. They were a soap company. They were a candle company, and since then, they've become everything else in between, and it had to do with the adaptability. I'd like to go real quickly. We've got many questions coming in from the audience. I want to specifically ask, answer, uh, ask a couple of those. Um, Claude Diederich. Hi, Claude. Thanks for this question. He asked the question, to what extent is the willingness of a change, uh, uh, sorry, to what extent is the willingness to change of a firm causally related with their management or employees' views of the severity of the sickness. Um, in, in other words, waiting between focusing on health versus reopening the economy. So I guess he's, he's asking the question, you know, if you're really open, you might be um, uh, viewing it's not so severe or the other way. Any thoughts on this? It's an interesting question, Claude. Thank you. Uh, well, personally, um, I think that, um, well, actually this somehow, I, I also want to add something first uh, to Robert's uh, question earlier, because um, it's very interesting that Emin and Viviana has mentioned some interesting point about leadership. And here I wanted to add something about the organizational uh, practices of the company, uh, which might also uh, lead to uh, an, an answer to Claude's uh, question, in fact. Um, well, a lot of the observation I had, uh, especially by comparing uh, some uh, Chinese uh, companies uh, with uh, multinational companies nowadays, is surprisingly, uh, we see that uh, a lot of the organizational designs of the multinationals uh, actually uh, appears to be um, better fitted for an for environment that is more stable. That is, every year uh, at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year, will make a plan about uh, uh, what to do for the next year, the budget and everything. And uh, of course, they are also thinking about meeting the needs of the company, uh, of the customers, but uh, somehow by fulfilling this procedure, then they can be significantly uh, slow in responding to the fast changing market change. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially nowadays, because the technology is becoming more complicated. Uh, which means like now if we look at one product, it's very rare for this product to uh, embody only one stream of technologies. Normally it's a combination of everything. Look at a smartphone, it's a combination of a camera, it's a combination of a phone, and uh, it's a combination of a computer. It's, you know, so, so it's, uh, it, so the, the changes in any of these technological trends actually leads to possibilities of improving these products. And also the demand of the customers also constantly changes and uh, because they are in, in touch of, uh, with new things all, all the time. So, so really, can we organize and lead, of course, in a way that really uh, start from the customer needs back to what we do instead of the other way around? That would be very important. The reason I say this is related with Claude's question is that um, I feel it's not entirely uh, about uh, how we view the severity of COVID-19. Uh, it, it's still related to, OK, whether our company is able to actually um, to respond quickly to the changes in the environment and the customer needs uh, because of COVID-19 or other things. It can be, it, it, I think it's, um, it, COVID is a very extreme example, mm -hmm. but uh, it resembles the changes our, our world can, can see and experience constantly. So, so, so I guess this is actually not just about COVID, it's actually an everyday, thing and uh, it's really about the change of 
uh, as Viviana said, the, the mentality of the le leadership and also then how we organize uh, to, uh, to be able to actually uh, have the capability to manage this kind of changes. Thank you. If, Thank if you. I may add, you know, just a, maybe a counter question at the end. I, I agree with what you have said, but I also think that the burning platform is a prerequisite actually to change. So you need to actually, you know, have the pressure to, to change. And here is maybe the nasty question. <laughs> uh, we see in many economies right now that many companies, employees, um, um, entrepreneurs, etc., are supported by government means, i.e. taxpayers' money. And the question is, to what extent does this, does this hamper a transformation and a, a fundamental change? I don't know, but I have my hypothesis about this question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. A specific question for you, Armin, uh, from Chander. Uh, Chander asked the question, if you have to, I'm going to condense it a little bit. If you have to pick out one element that was perhaps not so relevant pre-COVID, but is now a must-have regarding leadership, is there one? I, I would say that's a tough one to, to answer it in, in probably the 40 seconds you wanted to give me for that. But it's humility, I would say, for a leader. So the humility and the modesty to accept that you don't know everything. You have to ask questions. You have to listen to your clients, to your people, to actually make up your minds and, and maybe change your plans. So humility and modesty. Uh, I, I was reminded the other day, you know, all of us had to make decisions in last March here in Europe. And uh, I literally had to close the campus over a weekend and make a decision one night. And you don't have a lot to make the decision on. You call around to a couple of colleagues at a couple of other universities, you hear what they're doing, you call Shanghai, have a quick discussion, and you make a decision. Sure. And a lot of it, it's a, another analogy is, my, I yelled at my 16 year old, then 16 year old daughter one time, and she was very upset. And I had to go back and apologize to her. And I said to her, I've never been the father of a 16-year-old daughter before. Um, and for all of us who are parents, no, no, we make mistakes. We're making decisions and having communication that we've never done this before. Um, and, and a lot of leadership is that way. But the more change we've managed, the easier it is to manage change. That, there's that in there too. So on, the, on, your, on your humility and, and modesty, I would add your ability to make a clear, a clear decision, even if it's not the nicest one, and communicate it immediately and directly. I think that is also very, very important during these times. This is what we're doing, boom, uh, and as clearly as possible and not waver from it, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. It was one of the first questions. Yeah, considering the importance of quality, is it really, and this goes back to you, Ginko, uh, because it came up when you were talking, C considering the importance of quality, is it really a new paradigm or is it just a different market segmentation or competitive landscape or new, new I'll add this, new clientele where quality has become more important? Well, of course, quality has always been very important through all the time. What I have want to, uh, to, to say is that um, normally before we use uh, prices and brands as proxies of quality. Like, because for example, if you're looking at a bottle of shampoo, you actually do not know exactly how it will function, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to depend on uh, indicators like the prices and brands to suggest how good the quality of the product is. However, nowadays, as I uh, say, if we are shopping online, if I'm looking at the Amazon reviews, <laughs> oftentimes they drive you crazy, right? Because people say all sorts of, uh, about like different kinds of things about one same product. But still, you are able to obtain tremendous amount of information that you didn't have before. And a lot of the purchasing decisions are actually made according to this information 
uh, instead of only the price and the brand. That, that's what I say. So what I'm emphasizing, so the change is not about how important or not important quality is for different groups of customers. What I meant to emphasize is that the so-called information capability, that is the capability of a common individual like you and me to know, to have enough information or to have uh, the abundance of information about this product, this capability changes. Mm -hmm. And that changes the way people handle business. Because for example, it can change the way people do their pricing strategy, for instance. Like uh, you might mark your price high, but uh, and pack it beautifully, but uh, somehow now this strategy may not work. And, and also it even changes the importance of brands. If you're looking at the brands today, and many people are actually complaining about people are losing their the loyalty to the brand. Mm. I think it's not just about loyalty. It's not like nowadays people suddenly become you know, in loyal or something. It's just because nowadays people are getting direct contact with so many different other products that they have information about. So those information will encourage them to try those new products. So it appears then the, the stickiness, the, the, like the, the loyalty then of these customers towards brands might weaken. And, and that's a very uh, significant change for business leaders, especially if they're in, in retail. So that, that's actually what I meant. Thank you. We're over time. We could continue to this discussion for hours, I'm sure. Um, but uh, our, we promise to be on time for you. You've got other events. Our, our clients who are ob observing, participating here are beginning to drop off because we also try and finish on time. I say thank you to all of the, uh, uh, to, to the participants for joining today. Thank you very much, Ginko and Viviana and Armin for your inputs. I'd like to send you some of the open questions that we still have it's always our promise that we send it to, uh, to you, back to you. And if you have a thought or answer, and then we would send it back to everyone who, who's on the, online today as a way to, um, because there's a bunch of questions that we uh, still have an, an answer. I will say though, to the audience, if there's something that's kind of politically related, we're not going to answer it. We just ignore it. And this wasn't specifically about vaccine, COVID vaccines and opening economies and things like that. So it's, it's not really related to the topic of new business uh, models. Okay. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Rob. Have a great afternoon. Great thank evening. You, thank Great you. seeing you, Ginko. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.